Hello, I'm Ron Clark. Today we're going to talk about step nine, but first we'll recap where you have gotten so far. You've been at it for at least four years. That's, whew, that's a lot. Congratulations and thank you. Um, with step eight, you've achieved freedom, <laughs> really. With mental wandering, you are now free. You are a free human being. You can go anywhere you want. You can look in on any time, any when you want. But mostly you are free. You can go anywhere to do your work as a magician. You are now free. And in step eight, uh, you conquered, or you mastered uh, the fluids, the work with the fluids. This is the, really one of the greatest magical techniques available to you, the work with the fluids. We're going to refine it here in step nine, but you've got the basics. You can do anything with the fluids. This is very powerful stuff, and I hope you are using this magic to help. You know, that's the whole point. You, uh, have spent at least four years becoming a helpful human being. The true meaning of a human being with the full array of powers that a human being possesses. So, I hope you're busy being a human being and healing, healing your fellow person healing your fellow creatures, healing your planet, healing. That's what it means to be a magician, to be a healer in all these different levels, all these different ways, for all these different creatures, both planetary and universal, okay? Uh, and you've also now have opened the door to Barden's further works. The practice of magical evocation and the key to the true Kabbalah. This is the point at which you can begin to pursue both of those disciplines if you want. It is entirely up to you. There's no requirement that you venture into evocation, and there's no requirement that you enter into Kabbalistic speech. If you are, then with evocation, you need to set aside your preconceptions to have a genuine experience in this field. Uh, Evocation, the beginning of evocation is mental wandering in the realms from which you want to evoke. There's really no reason to practice evocation. What there is a reason for and a need for is for you to wander in these realms, both the realms of the elemental beings and the realms of the higher spheres. You can only reach the higher spheres with your mental body. So the work of uh, step nine, uh, astramental uh, wandering, isn't going to be of any additional help in those realms. Um, you can travel astrally in the realms of the elementals, the realms of the elements, the elemental principles, um, and uh, you can uh, travel astrally 
in the zone girdling the earth. Um, but there's really no reason to do that. You can do that mentally now, which I suggest as actually preferable to the astral wandering in those realms. Um, for the, the main reason that you can have a more objective experience of these realms in your mental body alone than you can in the astral. Okay? The astral is much more subjective in its uh, perceptions, but the mental realm is purely, uh, the mental perceptions are purely objective. Um, well, we'll save that discussion for step 10 when Barton really introduces a uh, journey into other realms. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you have all the tools to go ahead and do that at this point and to work with PME. Now, Kabbalistic speech is a whole nother uh, ball of wax. <laughs> It's unlike anything you have done to date. Uh, and you have to go in and into it without expectations and preconceptions. Because it will not fit with any of your preconceptions, let's put it that way. And it is also a major work. It will take you at least as long as it's taken you with initiation into hermetics so far at least that long to really master the subject and really be creative Kabbalistically. So, something to look at, explore, uh, experiment with if you want. So, step nine. Uh, the work of step nine is primarily um, astral wandering. Uh, there is some exercises in the physical section, which are very advantageous. The mental section, I'm not really sure why he wrote the majority of this section. Uh, he does talk about uh, various ways of using the magic mirror, which is very beneficial, and I hope you will explore those. It's very self-explanatory as well and there's no point in me commenting on it. Um, but the beginning of the mental section, he goes on this uh, explanation of the um, way that uh, certain subtle senses can arise through the negation of the elements. And he's talking here mostly about uh, pathological um, negation of the elements that results in uh, the subtle senses uh, emerging. Um, mostly accidental. Um, so I, I'm not really sure why he talks about this except uh, from a, perhaps a therapeutic standpoint. This is good knowledge to have, you know, if you're a therapist working with people um, who have these problems. I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, it's fairly useless from the perspective of practical magic. Um, then he does, like I said, talk about various uses of the magic mirror, and this is valuable uh, work. Um, I recommend it at any rate. Um, then we come to astral wandering and the astral exercises of this step. Um, <clears throat> now astral wandering is more properly or more accurately termed astral mental wandering because it's mental wandering but with the astral body in addition to the mental body. Um, like I said, the astral body limits uh, where you can go, but it is a different 
um, experience than mental wandering. It's more sensorial. That's what you're bringing with you. You're bringing with you your astral senses and the astral body. So it's more uh, physical-like in the perceptions and the experience. It's um, much more thrilling physically than mental wandering. And that's really the only reason for astral wandering. Um, it's interesting. <laughs> Um, but it's no more useful than mental wandering. So, something you need to learn, but whether you use it much at all will be up to you. Personally, I don't. Personally, I much prefer to uh, do all of my work from the perspective of mental wandering. Um, with a really true full mastery of the elements and the fluids, there is no need to do that kind of work uh, from the perspective of the astral body. Um, granted, at first it's a little more convenient if you're going for an astral or a physical effect, um, but, you know, this is all down to mastery of the elements and the fluids. If you've mastered them, fully mastered them, then it's no problem to create a physical effect with the elements or the fluids while just in your mental body. So, so the process for learning astral wandering is very similar um, to that of mental wandering. You exteriorize your mental body you stand next to your physical body, looking at your physical body. Then you draw the astral body out of your physical body and stand it right next to you. Now, the drawing of the astral body may take a little bit of getting used to. You may need to use your creative imagination to visualize the astral body exiting your physical body. And it wants to be uh, basically the same shape and size as your physical body. Okay. Uh, it will have much the same appearance as your physical body. Um, that evolves over time of astral wandering, astromental wandering, as you get more accustomed to it, as the, uh, the core that connects the astral body to the physical body becomes more elastic, your physical, your astral appearance will reflect who you are. Um, it will become obvious to anybody who sees your astral form exactly who you are as a person. So it becomes a more and more clear reflection as you progress in this technique. So, you have this astral form your astral form standing next to you, and then you project your mental awareness into that astral form. So your mental body is joining the astral form and existing within the astral form. And you now look out through your astral eyes at your physical body. And that's where you start, just with this process of drawing the astral body out of the physical body, joining with the astral body, and looking out through the astral eyes. This is the step, first step you have to master in the process. And it'll take a little getting used to, shouldn't take you very long at all, um, to accomplish and get used to. Once you are used to that, then you begin moving away from the physical body. You take one step away, and you get used to that. Then you take 
a second step and get used to that, etc. And slowly increase your distance from the physical body. And while you're doing that, as, before, as with the mental wandering, you're going to verify your perceptions after each session. So, do the session, then go back in your physical body and verify your perceptions. So, the reason we do this so slowly is that cord that connects the astral body to the physical body. Now, we've, we've already experienced the, the cord that connects the mental body to the physical body, but that is naturally um, uh, more elastic. There is no real uh, magnetic attraction between the mental body and the physical body. It's very easy for us to leave and to leave the physical vicinity. The astral body is different. Normally, our astral body is, you know, very firmly united to our physical body, and it's unnatural for us to withdraw the astral body from the physical body. Um, so, that cord at the beginning is a very thick, sort of meaty thing. And what we need to do is we need to stretch that muscle. We need to stretch that out and gradually stretch it. We want to be gentle with the astral cord. Uh, we don't want to damage it. We don't want to enter, injure it in any way. So we slowly move away. And it will try to draw us back into the physical body. And we have to fight against that. That has to be stretched until it is very, very elastic before we can really move any distance in our astral body. So, each session we want to move just a little bit further and gently stretch that cord and make it more and more elastic. And it will take a little while to do that. Uh, you know, walk a couple steps, give it some time to heal itself from that stretch. Next session, walk a few steps further, etc. And eventually, we end up leaving our apartment or our house and walking around. And eventually, it will become so elastic that you can go anywhere in the physical realm that you can go with your mental body. You know, in an instant, you can be on the other side of the planet, no problem but you will be in your astral form. Now, the astral perceptions differ from the mental perceptions. The mental perceptions are all about the meaning of everything. That communicates itself to you very clearly. Here, it's about the significance of everything. So it's much more subjective, and it's much more energetic. You know, Barton describes the astral experience as being the ecstasy. And it is ecstatic, but it's, but it's probably not quite the ecstasy you expect. It's not the, the blissful ecstasy. It's more the electric ecstasy. Like, oh my God! You know, and it will have that sensation that just, almost identical to physical sensation, uh, this really energetic sensation. And that takes a while to get used to and a while to overcome, basically. Because, you know, inclination will be to just fly with that sensation. But you want to avoid doing that. You know, you want to, again, control your emotional responses in the light of this astral experience, because this is, this is your personality, this is all of your emotions that you are traveling with, which is going to be different than the mental travel, which is very dispassionate by comparison. So it's, you know, it's, it's a fuller experience in many ways. Um, in mental wandering, we learn about other people and other cultures. But here, the astral experience of those other people and other cultures is more, uh, more holistic in a sense. Um, so, 
it will flesh out in many ways your mental perceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be more involved, really, uh, in what you perceive uh, with your astral body. So, you know, learn to astral wander or astramental wander. Remember, the mental body is always there, so it can be, should be a mediating influence on your astral responses to things. And it will be very educational and very exciting. Now, at the same time as you're working on the astral wandering, and there is another work to do. And it must be at the same time. It's not astral wandering and then the separate astral work. Uh, it should be simultaneously. And this is the impregnation of the astral body with the four divine fundamental qualities. Now these relate to the elements. That's why there's four of them. And they are as follows. With four relating to the fire principle, there is the, the omnipotence, the all-powerfulness, and with the air, there is the all-knowing, omniscience. And with the water, there is the omnipresent, the omnipresence being everywhere simultaneously. And with the earth, there is immortality, the, the life which does not end. It has no beginning and no ending. Okay? I've included an essay in the um, comments below the video. I've included a link to an essay that I wrote in 2004 on the four divine principles to, you know, help you understand a little more fully uh, what those words mean. Those words can be very misleading. Uh, if we take them only in their mundane sense. So, this is much more philosophical. So, you want to begin the process of uh, adopting those four fundamental qualities in your astromental awareness. Mm -hmm. And that work then continues in step, step 10. A very extraordinary ways. Okay. Uh, the physical section is various advanced uses of the elements and the fluids. And this is um, very illuminating information and lots of good techniques to experiment with in that section. And you should experiment with these various techniques. And eventually, you'll develop your own way of working with the elements and the fluids, especially. There is one uh, technique that I highly recommend, and I find it to have been very, very useful, and it's called vaulting. Working with the vaults. Um, he explains two uses of Vaulting. One is to uh, empower an amulet with a vault, and the other is to cast the vault into the akasha. So a vault is composed of both fluids. You start with an internal core of the electric fluid, um, say in a sphere. In a sphere is the easiest to work with. A little sphere of very dense accumulation of the electric fluid. And you've already learned the methods for uh, quickly accumulating the electric fluid. So this has to be very, very dense. Now, the distance between the center of that sphere of electric fluid and the outer edge of that electric fluid, so that distance, you want to create then, secondarily, a coating of the magnetic fluid, a very dense coating of the magnetic fluid, again a sphere, that is of the same depth as the electric fluid that you just created. So it ha they have to be 
in this specific ratio to each other, an equal ratio essentially. So you have electric fluid on the inside covered by a uh, surrounding of the magnetic fluid. And then you fill this whole volt with your magical will, you know, whatever the, the volt is to do, to accomplish, and then you put it in the amulet, whatever. Or you can build it just around the amulet. Um, and that's how you empower it. It's very, very, very powerful way of charging an amulet or any thing um, very powerful uh, thing to do. So if this um, is to uh, affect um, yourself, if it's for you, you can draw the um, fluids through your body, okay? You can accumulate them in your body and project them. If they are, if it is to affect someone else, then you must draw them from the universe directly instead of being from your body. Now, the second thing, which is a really, really powerful and wonderful uh, um, work to do, uh, vaulting into the Akasha. So you create your vault in front of you, suspended in the air, and you make this as powerful a vault as you can, and you as powerfully as you can uh, impress your mental will on the vault, you know, your very specific instructions of what you want to accomplish. And then you fling it into the Akasha. Now this is not the astral ether that we've dealt with before, the Akasha with a small a. This is the Akasha with a big a. And that Akasha is the membrane, as it were, between the unmanifest potential and manifest reality. So this is a very specific location, as it were, into which you are th casting this volt. And anything that is put there of this nature immediately manifests itself. It immediately descends through the mental, astral, and into the physical plane. Uh, because that's what happens in the Akasha with a big A. That is the whole, that is what the Akasha does. I mean, that's why we call this membrane the Akasha. Because it, anything placed within it manifests. Okay. So... That is the work of step nine. It's primarily learning um, the astral um, wandering, the astramental wandering. Um, step ten, well, step nine will take you however long it takes you, however long you want to spend exploring um, these uh, the universe through astromental wandering and the inculcation of the four fundamental divine qualities and these various other uh, magical works uh, like vaulting. So, who knows how long it will take. That is entirely up to you. There is no set amount of time you need to spend on that in this step. It needs to be your judgment of what sort of progress you have made with these techniques and these tasks. So, step 10, like I said, is a whole nother ball of wax. Um, and we'll talk about that when you get there. Okay, that's it for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>